ready for takeoff. I'm Keith Bennett. Thank you for being here. I'm going to talk about Lambdas, Ruby. I'm a Ruby, not Rails developer. Um, I say that playfully. I, you know, I have nothing against Rails, but just my career experience hasn't included very much of it. I do a lot more of um, command line applications, uh, tools for testing and networking, um, and um, uh, yeah. So Ruby, not Rails, but uh, maybe in the future, Rails. I don't know. I'm not a functional programming expert. Um, I've just dabbled a little bit in Elixir and Clojure and Erlang a few years ago. I just did some superficial study and really liked it and, and tried to bring some of the concepts to my Ruby programming. We'll be talking about lambdas, obviously. What is a lambda? What does it look like? What is it good for? And how is it used? A lambda is a free-floating function. It's not a part of a, it's not a, an instance of a, well, it's an instance of the lamp of a proc class, but it's, it's not really um, attached to a, an object. Do you remember when you encountered code blocks for the first time? Do you remember how they were confusing at first? If, if they weren't confusing, then you're smarter than I am, because for me, they were confusing. I was wondering, like, where does this, how does this work? Yeah. But we persevered and we mastered them. Was it worth the effort? Of course. Lambdas are the next step in that progression. They're unfamiliar to many of us, but mastering them will bring a lot of benefits, such as these. Let's look at the ways to call a lambda. First, let's define one. Can you see my cursor there? Yes, great, glad that's working. Um, so here's a lambda uh, that takes a single parameter and returns whether or not it's a multiple of two, therefore whether or not it's even. And we're assigning it to a local variable called is even. Now, unfortunately, you can't uh, end a local variable name with a question mark. That would be nice, but you can't. So that's a terrible thing that you lose when you use lambdas in, in local variables. Um, of course, the conventional notation is to use the call method by name. But there's also an abbreviated notation, dot parentheses. You can also, strangely, call a lambda by using square brackets. But please don't do this, because when most of us see square brackets, we think there's a collection that we're trying to find something in. Of course, if you're in a community where everybody's doing it and everybody understands it, it's a convention, then that's fine. But usually, that's not the case. The case equality operator, the triple equals, will also call a lambda. But this, too, is confusing, and I don't recommend it. However, in a case statement, it can be handy. If you specify a lambda in a case statement in the when clause, then that lambda will be called with the case variable as a parameter. A lot of times I'm going to be talking about lambdas and procs, but a lot of times it really doesn't matter whether the object in question is a lambda or anything containing a call method. And the best name that I can come up for this broader category is callable, anything with a call method, including all proc instances, lambdas and non-lambdas, modules or classes with a call class method, instances of classes having a call instance method, and any other object having a call method added to it directly. Here's an example of a method that you could use to test whether or not something is a callable. It simply calls respond to, and passing it call. Um, we create a class with a call class method, a class with a call instance method. And when we call callable on all these four, they all return true. So here's just an empty lambda, an empty non-lambda proc, a class with a class method call, and um, an instance whose class has an instance method call. They're all true. So they're all interchangeable. When you have a method that's taking a callable in, it doesn't have to be a lambda. It can be anything with a call method because of Ruby's duct typing, unlike pretty much every other language, I think. 
And as a result, the dot parens notation can be used for any of these callables, not just procs or lambdas. If you want to use a lambda where a code block is expected, you just precede it with an ampersand here. If you want to use a method where a lambda is expected, you can do this. In Ruby versions before 1.9, this was the only way to specify a lambda. Uh, notice it's, it's really the same as a code block. And starting in 1.9, we had the stabby lambda notation added, which we can use this way. If there are parameters to the lambda, then this is the way to pass them in the old uh, notation, which is the same notation as with code blocks. And with the stabby lambda, it's the same notation as method calls. Self-invoking anonymous functions. It's a fancy name for something that calls itself and is not named. Um, we have three lines of code here, and we have them enclosed in a lambda. Why would we want to do that? Isn't that silly? Why don't we just use those three lines without the lambda? Well, once in a while, it comes in handy for hiding the variable names, the local variables, from the outer scope. And um, when I worked at CoffeeScript a few years ago, they recommended doing this for that very reason. Um, the dot parens notation is a little bit interesting in that you really need to use it. Um, uh, um, you can't just, like with method calls in Ruby, normally you don't need parentheses, but if you're using a dot paren notation, you do. Um, here we create a lambda, here we try to execute it, but IRB just returns the object itself, the lambda object itself. And of course, if, if you use the conventional method name, you don't need the parentheses. One of the things that's, it's kind of confusing. The, the PROC class, capital P-R-O-C class, um, can produce instances that are lambdas and instances that are not lambdas. And the naming is unfortunate because the name of the class, PROC, is the same as the name of the non-lambda PROC when we define it using this. So in spoken language, if somebody says PROC, it's really ambiguous. Um, and so for that reason, I usually use the term non-lambda proc when I mean an instance of the proc class, which is not a lambda. Um, and so here we have a lambda. We ask for its class, its proc. We ask, are you a lambda? This is a method on the proc class, an instance method. It says, yes. Here's a proc. Are you a, uh, what is your class, proc? Are you a lambda? No. Let's compare the behavior of lambdas and non-lambda procs. The re return behavior is different. A lambda's return returns only from the lambda and not from the enclosing method or lambda. As an example, we have a method foo, we have a, a lambda, and we execute it right there in place. Are we going to see this? What will it be returned from? Well, it turns out we do see this. So this lambda returned from itself, but not from the foo method. In contrast, a non-lambda proc return returns from its enclosing scope. If we do the same thing but with a proc instead of a lambda, we don't see that still in foo because it has returned from the method. Arity checking. Uh, in case you're not familiar with the term arity, it's just a number of parameters passed to a method. Checking is making sure that the correct number has been passed. Lambdas have strict arity checking. Blocks and non-lambda procs do not. Here's a lambda that's expecting two arguments. If we call it with one, we get an error. In contrast, if we have a proc, there's no complaint. And if we have a code block, then there's also no complaint. So if we define this method here, which creates two random point values and passes them to the past block, um, if the block that is passed is only expecting one parameter, there's no complaint. It just uses the first value and substitutes anything else, uh, nil, for anything else that's missing. Um, if we pass it the right number, of course, it works correctly. If we pass it too many, it still works correctly, but it uses nil for anything missing. So, oh, I, I just want to say before I go on to that, um, well, I'll wait for that. I have a, another slide. Lambdas and procs are selfless. 
Um, if you say put self, you won't get the proc instance that the lambda is. Um, you'll get whatever it happens to be in. Um, and in IRB, the name of the enclosing object is main, so that's why we see that there. Same thing with non-lambda procs. So because of these things, ta-da, um, because of the differences in behavior of arity checking and return behavior, I believe that lambdas are preferable. They're safer. They're, they're more restrictive. Um, now, if, of course, of course if, if you need that looser behavior, that's fine. But I, I think we probably rarely do need that behavior. Unnecessary complexity is our enemy, right? You don't want a coworker who's going to make something overly complex because it's going to be harder to understand, modify, et cetera. As software developers, we strive to maximize the ratio of functionality over complexity. We want to maximize the functionality we give our users. We want to minimize the complexity that, with which we will need to deal as time goes on with this software. Why do we use local variables? To limit their scope. Why? Does it improve simplicity, re reliability, readability? Yes. Regarding the number of instance methods in a class, you may have encountered a situation where there is just a really large number of instance methods in a class. One metric of that complexity is the number of possible paths of interaction. And it turns out there's a formula to calculate that. It's the number of methods times the quantity that number minus one. So this is a very small class, um, but imagine in your head that it were larger. With only five methods, we have a complexity value of 20. In my experience, it's very often that uh, a method is used by only one other method. So let's say, as an example, two of these methods are used by only one, one of them. If we could find a way to move those two into that method, look at the difference in the complexity metric. It's less than a third. So of course, there'd be a, a tiny bit of complexity in the, in the right side triangle, but very little. So let's see if there's a way we could do that. Well, it turns out that in Ruby, you can define methods within other methods. We have a class C here. We have an outer method. We just output a message, and then we define another method. So we create an instance of that class. We call outer. Fine. It's defining the method. It says it is. So how would you call the inner method of a method? Well, my best guess is that it would be outer.inner. So let's try that. Eh, doesn't work. What's going on? Well, it turns out that inner is just a regular instance method like any other instance method. So we can't use methods as inner methods in Ruby. We cannot. But guess what we can use instead? Lambdas, or procs. Um, I call it encapsulation light because it's on a very micro level. Uh, we can use lambdas as local nested functions. Here we have a, uh, a method. And um, we want to take the two parts of the input and apply the same behavior computation to both of them, identical computation. So we create a lambda to do that computation and then call it twice here. Now, um, in case you're not familiar with uh, multiple return values in Ruby, um, this is the way you do it. You just create an array and return the array. And then in Ruby, you can deconstruct an array by just giving a comma-separated list of variable names, and it'll put the appropriate array value into the appropriate local variable name, uh, variable. But let's say there were many lambdas and not only one. Would you notice anything inter interesting about the structure of that method? You have a method with a lot of little pieces of isolated behaviors in them. It's kind of like a class, right? So a, a lot of times I'm, I'm writing a method and it's getting more and more complex and I say, okay, this should really be a separate behavior, but I won't put it into an instance method yet. I'll put it into a lambda and um, I'll keep going. And once in a while it just gets so complex that I realize this really should be a class of its own. Um, or sometimes some of them should really be instance methods. Um, so a method with nested lambdas can easily be converted into a class. Here with the case we had before, we just create the compute part method and, um, and we call it. Um, and this is the way we would call it. In practice, I would make these class methods so that there would be no need to create an instance. It's kind of useless. 
to have an instance there. Um, so might as well even be a module. Um, and so we have, uh, this makes these all class methods of the module or module methods. I'm not sure what the right name for that is. Um, and then they could be called in the same way. A very common use case for lambdas in my experience is formatters. I do a lot of um, command line work, and so um, I don't use CSS for formatting, I use printf. Um, and so that's what you'll see here. Um, let's say I wanted to produce an output like this here, these last three lines. If we look at them, we see that they follow the same pattern. We have a caption, a colon, and a value. So what do we do about that? Well, let's look at the bottom of this first. The return value is a multi-line string, and because we have the lower level behavior isolated into a lambda, the reader does not have to bother filtering out that low level implementation to understand what's going on. They say, okay, something's it's being formatted in some way, and here are the values that are being formatted. And if they care to see the low level implementation, they can go look at it, but they probably won't, and it saves people time when they're reading. Um, so there are two really good benefits of this. One of them is that the code is more dry, that is, don't repeat yourself. And the other is that you're separating high from low level code. And in my experience, one of the things that makes code the most difficult to understand is when high and low level code are just mixed in together. It's really important and helpful to separate them if you can. Here's another example of using lambdas for um, uh, well, we're using them for formatters, but in, in, in a list of interchangeable formatters. Um, we have a hash here. This is from my Rex gem, R-E-X-E, -E, which um, does some stuff to make command line use of Ruby simpler with inputting uh, different formats, outputting different formats, and some other things. And um, so you can configure this to use different formatters and parsers. And um, so you would give a command line option, minus ij or something like that, and it would come in and say, okay, Jace, that would be converted into this symbol. And then um, uh, this hash would be something that then the configuration could just fetch the, the callable for that symbol and plug that into a variable and then just use that for the remainder of the program. Same thing with parsers. Oh, and I just wanted to mention here, of course, these callables these callables all need to have the same interface. They say, take the same parameter and return the same kind of thing. In, in short, they need to be interchangeable. And so in, in that case, we were taking an object and returning a string. In the case of parsers, we're taking in a string and returning an object. And so this is where the configuration would put it all together. It would take those formats and then look up the behaviors corresponding to the options and store them in instance variables and then use them later. Lambdas are handy for threads. When you create a thread and, and, and launch it, you pass it a code block, but using the ampersand, you can use a lambda instead. And so then you have all the power of lambdas combining and, and that kind of thing. Um, that can be handy at times. Lambdas are closures. They carry with them the context of the scope in which they were defined. So if there's a, a local variable n, which is 15, we can output it. Now we could pass this to uh, somewhere else in the program and it would still work. Fortunately or unfortunately, you could also modify those values and that could be a problem. But if it is a problem, you can tell Ruby, oops, I want this n variable to be a local lambda variable. Don't use the enclosing scope. And, and that works fine. Lambdas, you can call binding on a lambda and you'll get the binding that contains those local variable definitions and some other information. I don't know if that would ever be useful, but it's there if you want it. Private methods are not really private, right? You can call send to call them. If you want something to be really private, you could put it in a lambda and assign it to a local variable. And um, that would be totally invisible to the outside. Why would you want to do that? I'm not sure. You know, maybe if, if you don't want your library users to cheat and use things that you didn't want them to use because you're going to change them later, well, Lambda would work for that. Unfortunately, it also means that you can't get to it with a unit test either. 
So if you really, really need to unit test this behavior, if it's not enough to test the, the behavior of the method in which the lambda lives, you really need to test the behavior of the lambda, you're out of luck. You probably want to make that a method instead of a lambda. Lambdas are great lightweight event handlers. Um, can be define a lambda and then put in a variable and then pass it, or you can just um, define it in place here without assigning it to a variable. And check out this notation and compare it with what it would look like if you were passing a code block. It's almost the same. The only difference is the parentheses and the arrow, right? So syntactically, um, it's, it's really no big deal to use a lambda instead of a block. Of course, the, the thing you're calling needs to be able to deal with it, and it, it will be dealt with differently on that end. For a lot of us that come from object-oriented languages other than Ruby, we're used to using classes for polymorphism. Um, and um, so we would have classes here. In Java, you'd need to create an interface, defining the, even, uh, the call method. Um, and um, it's a lot of verbosity, right? Compare that with this. Lambdas are just so simple. They're really good in cases where you just need something really simple. Predicates are functions that return either true or false. And we use them a lot in Ruby, um, the select, for example. Um, this is a method that takes a filter for messages and only adds to a list those messages that pass that filter. This is what it might look like if we used a lambda as a parameter. We have a parameter called filter, and we give it a default value, which is a lambda that returns true unconditionally. In, in other words, not filtered at all. Where we call it, we can say, do this if the filter returns true. That's pretty simple and self-explanatory, right? If we contrast this with the more conventional use of code blocks, first of all, there's no mention of the code block in the signature. Now, yes, we can specify the, the name. We can specify a name and then use that name. But it's conventionally not done. Usually it's not done. Um, and also, more importantly, look at how this is being called. Does that give you a clue about what's going on in terms of the, the, the actual logic that it, that that it's a filter, for example? Not really. It's kind of um, obtuse, in my opinion. Furthermore, if we need to pass multiple behaviors, we certainly can't use code blocks, because we only get one code block per method call, right? So um, here's an example of um, something that takes two. Um, This is another, uh, about the idea of separating high from low level uh, concerns and also separating just unrelated concerns into different areas of the code. Um, this is uh, a method, I, I was working with um, uh, ingesting network messages from various sources and then um, filtering them, want to get rid of some of them, only want some to keep. Um, and there were different types of messages and different types of behavior to apply to them. And the first time I approached this, I just wrote it all in one place. And I thought, there's so much going on here. This is so complex. If I'm doing two things in the same area of code, then my complexity is probably two squared, right? It's probably four. But if I can separate them out, it might be a quarter as complex. And it's certainly easier to read. So I created this buffered enumerable class, which just handled the process of um, receiving the, the um, the messages and, and buffering them and then yielding them. Um, and within that, parameterized the behavior that knew how to fetch the messages and the behavior that notified you in whatever way you wanted that a, uh, a chunk of messages had been fetched, maybe a log, maybe a progress indicator or something like that. Um, so la lambdas are great for that kind of thing. Now, here's a really weird uh, thing that I learned, and I, I don't know if it really has any use in the real world at all, but you can define a class in a lambda using the conventional class definition no notation. Um, you could define a class in a method by using the define class and define method, that kind of thing. But if you want it to look as if it were uh, a conventional class definition, you could do that in a lambda, as long as that lambda is not defined inside a method. So here, we're creating a lambda and assigning it to a class constant. Um, and if we have a method 
that calls the lambda, whoop, and then call it, um, then that works. Um, again, I'm not sure if that's useful at all, but I thought it was fascinating that you could do that. Transform chains, um, ETL light again. Um, usually when we work with enumerables, we, we take um, a list of values and iterate over them with the same behavior. I'm talking about taking a list of behaviors and iterate over them with a single value, uh, actually in, in sequence. So let's say we have um, a tripler lambda and a squarer lambda, and we put them in an array, and then we have a starting value of four. Um, this is called transformers, so we call inject, give it that starting value of four, and then apply each behavior in succession to the value, accumulating a final result. So again, I'm not so sure you know, when or how this would be useful, but it's, it's really interesting that this can be done, and it might come in handy sometime. As you work with lambdas more, you may find that there's duplication that you would want to resolve. Here is an example. All of these, meth all of these lambdas are multiplying n by a, a factor. There are two major ways to deal with this. One of them is called partial application, um, which is basically creating a method or lambda that um, pre-fills value or values in another lambda. So here's an example. We have a lambda which takes in a factor, and it has a lambda here that it's returning, and it's hard coding that factor into this lambda. And by the way, this, this hard coded factor is now immutable. Um, and that can be handy as well. So we can call it with a three, for example. It'll hard code that three here, and it'll return a lambda that returns n times three. The other way, uh, oh, and, and that outer thing doesn't have to be a lambda, of course. It can be a method as well. Because lambdas are first class functions, um, they can be used like any variable. Um, and so it can be returned by a method. Currying is, uh, oh, let me check the time, two minutes. <laughs> Currying is uh, the other way to do that. Um, let's say you have a, a, a lambda that takes two numbers. You can prefill a three in there by calling dot curry and passing three to that, and then you get that tripler. The other thing you can do is, if you want to split that out, you could just get the return value from curry and put it in a variable called courier. Uh, this just might be simpler to understand. Uh, it's not something that you might want to do. I don't know. Um, and um, then you just pass three to that courier, and you get the tripler. And we're done. Thank you for listening. Um, I'll leave my contact information up there for as long as they keep that on. Um, feel free to contact me. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>